Hello everybody, welcome back. So in this brief video, we are going to talk a little bit about how to draft an argument. Um, this is coming from chapter 4 of our textbook, Good Reasons. Um, it has some good advice. It has All of this is very basic stuff. And um, honestly, you've written in high school. You've written probably for other courses at UTD. Um, you, you know some of this already you ha probably have your own method for starting the essay process. But if you don't, if you end up confused and befuddled every time, then this chapter can give you some places to start. Um, you know, so what is... Basically, let's just run through the textbook and uh, take a look at some examples, and then we'll run through kind of a sample process. Um, just real brief. So, first off... Uh, identify a purpose for your argument. Why are you arguing? What's the purpose of this essay that you are trying to write? In other words, read the prompt. Make sure that you know what's being asked for and that you're actually meeting those things. And then try to come up with a thesis, or at least a hypothesis. Um, you know, this is the preliminary stages. You should have a thesis, you should have an idea. But if your research does not bear that out, then you need to change your thesis. Um, and the book makes a good point. Don't settle for a thesis that's too broad and too easy. Um, from my own example, uh, superheroes teach us things. Well, yeah, so does just about everything. That's, that's not an arguable position. Everybody agrees with that. Um, you would have to be more specific in your argument. Don't say something like, you know, especially for, like, your third paper, uh, pollution is bad. No shit. Um, you know, if, if that's the answer to your thesis is no shit, then you need a better thesis. You need to narrow your focus down. You need to be more precise. Um, and at the same time, this, less, this is less common, but don't make your thesis too narrow. Um, in this instance, and no others, this, th this thing occurs then why do we care if that's just the sole instance of it? Um, I know that's not the best of examples, but honestly, too broad is what I see a lot more often than too narrow. But do be aware of that. All right. Um, and it gives some good tools for evaluating your thesis. Four big questions. Is it arguable? Is it specific? Is it manageable, given the length and requirements? And is it interesting to your intended readers? So, um, on the topic of your readers, think about your reader. Who is your audience? Now, for most of the papers that you write here in this class, I am your audience. But, be careful not to write to your teacher. What I mean is, don't say something like, as you mentioned in class, yada yada yada. Um, your teacher is your audience, but in more, it's better to think of your teacher as representative of your audience. They have certain knowledge. They have at least a basic background. They're probably an intelligent person, especially if it's a college professor, I should hope. Um, they may or may not agree with you. They have their own stances, but they're at least theoretically willing to hear you out because that's their job. So you're looking at an audience that's willing to listen, maybe stubborn about it, maybe may disagree with you entirely, but is at least open-minded. Um, is intelligent, expects a certain standard of intelligence from you, and of a certain standard of formality from you. Um, you know, these are people used to writing in academic settings where formality is a demand. So don't write a, you know, hey, how you doing? How's it going? Don't use slang. Don't use various things. Um, yeah. And as the book says, understand your reader's attitudes towards your subject. You know, if you've got a controversial topic, you might have to win some people over. You might have to devote time to getting people on your side. Um, be before you can even start proving your point, you might have to deal with some negative ideas. So, yeah. Um, and then it goes into how to organize. It gives you some ideas for outlines. Uh, we have already done outlines, but as I think I was clear, as I hope I was clear... I don't care about what format you use. Really, I just want to see that you are working on these ideas. Um, 
gives you some ideas about how to write your introduction. You know, I think you've probably been taught about doing a hook already. Um, I don't think we need to spend as much time on introductions because I'm, I'm fairly confident that y'all are solid on that. If you're not, by all means, read the textbook. Uh, look up stuff online. You know, in brief, start with a hook. Start with an attention grabber. Uh, it can be a story. It can be an anecdote. It can be... A, I try to avoid personal statements and I statements, but sometimes it can be appropriate as an introduction. But, you know, something that grabs attention and then you end with your thesis and a preview of the essay. I'm a little more concerned about conclusions, um, if only because I suck at conclusions. I'm never sure what to write. So, uh, as the textbook says, there's a couple of different approaches you can use. You can try issuing a call to action. You can discuss the implications of your essay. You know, what does this mean? What's the big picture? You can make recommendations. You can project into the future. If we keep doing this or if we change, this will happen. You can tell an anecdote that illustrates a point. Uh, do try to restate your thesis to one degree or another. But yeah, so that's the textbook's take. Um, that's some of the basics that it goes over. I want to run real quick through a sample for you. Um, let me share my screen. There's the button. All right. So what we have here is a call for papers. Uh, if you decide to go into academia, you will see these a lot. It's basically a conference or a journal saying, we want papers on this topic. Here is your chance to do scholarship. And it gives you some ways to narrow your ideas and to get a little more focused. Um, so this is for the 2021 Research Arts and Writing Conference here at UTD in the Arts and Humanities Division for graduate students. Uh, it's not limited to graduate students. You can apply if you want, if you, you know, get the call. But it's, uh, at time of recording, it's, or, it's on the 20th. Uh, registration already, or application's already closed. So, yeah. But you can do it next year. And feel free to attend if, uh, if it sounds interesting at all. But basically, this is talking about the theme of hyperbole, sense, sensation, and spectacle. This is just about the conference. As interdisciplinary scholars, we encounter at every turn the classical rhetorical tool of hyperbole, understood in the sense of overstatement, going over the top, if you will, in the presentation of ideas. In every field of the humanities, we have the option of going to extremes in our use of words, images, and sounds designed to impress our own ideas upon the sensory apparatus of our audience. The compulsion to share our most intense perceptions with the other is a basic human trait. However, because we cannot share the first-person sense of shock that first impressed us, we language animals insert elements of hyperbole or overstatement that relay similarly heightened affective tensions. <coughs> excuse me, of wonder, joy, anger, horror, and so on. The humanities provide the core site of investigation into the phenomenon of hyperbole. As researchers, we seek to understand how overstatements have provided the rhetorical impetus vital to the unfolding of historical, literary, and aesthetic movements. As artists, we incorporate shocking imagery and to include our audience within the deep, significant, and emotional charge of the aesthetic event. As writers, we record the moments that destabilize us. One reliable tool in conveying a sense of the out of control is by jarring our readers' perceptions via the artful use of hyperbole. As humanity scholars seek to demonstrate the value of our research to a wider public, it is worth noting that the scholarly imperative to understand hyperbole has become ever more salient given our ever-evolving attention economy of screens and clicks. As interdisciplinary scholars, we are constantly interrogating the uses to which hyperbole is put in history books, literature, museum exhibits, art galleries, public history sites, and other aspects of human culture. We seek to understand how specific overstatements have shaped the past and present, while also recognizing the power artistic shock and awe possesses to transform and inspire the future. Our holistic approach allows us to the flexibility to contextualize the complexities of hyperbole as a figure not only of speech, but also of form. 
How can our rollover statement find its way into verbal, auditory, visual, and other media and spaces? So that's what this prompt is about, hyperbole. So mm -hmm. let's run through the basic steps that the book goes through of drafting an argument. First things first, what is your purpose? Well, in this case, if I want to do this, it's an essay about hyperbole and exaggeration. Mm -hmm. Now, that prompt, and hopefully the prompt for your essay, uh, gives you some ideas. What do I know about hyperbole? What do I know about exaggeration? Well, in my case, I wrote an essay for a class a couple of years ago about humor and rhetoric in a movie called Carnage that was a mockumentary about veganism. Um, and it used some extreme stuff. So when I think hyperbole, I think of that. Especially in terms of rhetoric, because... I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is brainstorming. What is the prompt? The prompt is about hyperbole. The purpose is writing an argue, article about hyperbole. Now I start brainstorming. There we go. That's how I get to my thesis. Or at least my hypothesis. And you can brainstorm any way you want. You can write little charts. You can write pros and cons. You can do a uh, stream of consciousness writing. You can do what I call the Hemingway method. Which is get drunk and see what happens. Um, now that said, if you choose to do the Hemingway method, sometimes also known as the uh, Willie Nelson method, if you choose... Uh, something smokable instead of alcohol. If you know of anybody who has gotten drunk or otherwise uh, intoxicated and started saying stuff, they say stupid things. If you want to get your ideas flowing with this method, you need to first train yourself to have clever thoughts. You need to spend time introspecting and thinking about basically these types of essays and these types of thought patterns. Train yourself to write essays like this, and then, when you become intoxicated, your mind will hit those patterns, and will start, will, but it will be more free and uninhibited, and will be allowed to make extra connections. The other thing to know about this is that it is a double-edged sword by many, to the most extreme. Um, for example, Hemingway drank himself into a depression and shot himself. Edgar Allan Poe, who was also fond of liquor, uh, drank himself to death. So have numerous other writers. Um, you know, Willie Nelson got arrested for a lot of marijuana possession. It can, it can screw you up. So use it with caution. Use it sparingly. But, you know, I, I won't lie to you and say it's not a tactic. It is a method of brainstorming. Uh, the ancient Greco-Roman world believed that you should discuss an idea twice. Once while drunk and once while sober. And if it actually sounded like a good idea both times, then it was a good idea. So, it has its places. Um, but do exercise caution and restraint and know your own limits. Travel safely, as the saying goes. So, I am on the topic of hyperbole. I want to make a thesis statement. I am brainstorming. In this case, it reminds me of that movie Carnage, which is about veganism. Especially this idea of rhetoric and hyperbole. Because Carnage is making the case that veganism is the moral thing to do. And it does it with extreme violent imagery, but also with humor. Which is why I find it interesting. So, I could write about something like hyperbole and rhetoric. But that's really, really broad. Like, that's just... Amongst other things, it's also probably been done. That's where introductory research takes a hold. You want to make sure you're not reinventing the wheel. So I went out searching to Google Scholar. Yeah, there's a whole bunch on rhetoric and hyperbole. Um, so that's not great. That's a little too broad. So I want to narrow it some. How about, as I said, rhetoric, hyperbole, and humor? Because the movie, it does use... In fact, the paper I wrote about it was looking at it using self-denigrating self humor as a rhetorical tool. So I could look at the, the conflux of hyperbole and rhetoric and humor. 
But, again, there's probably plenty of stuff about hyperbole and humor, and that can easily be applied to rhetoric. So in my case, I want to say hyperbole and humor do something to rhetoric. They are powerful tools of rhetoric, as shown in this specific example that's a really good example of it. So I know that's a really bare thesis, and that's very vague. Um, hyperbole and humor do something to rhetoric or enhance rhetoric, as shown in the movie Carnage. But it's a working thesis. It is arguable. They do something powerful. It is specific. Kinda. I need to work on it. But that's where the research comes in. As I research, I'm gonna tweak this thesis and get a better idea of it. It is manageable. Um, at time of writing, because I wanna brag, I've got about two weeks between the acceptance of my proposal and the time that my panel is due. So I've got two weeks two weeks to write this paper. Is this manageable in the time length? Well, it relates to another paper that I've already done without actually plagiarizing myself because if you submit a paper twice, counting it uh, for two different classes, that is plagiarism. Don't do it. But you can reference yourself. You can dovetail. You can use the same research for another project and come up with similar ideas. Um, and is, is it interesting? Well, humor is always fun. So, and at least for the academic audience that I'm dealing with, talking about rhetoric and hyperbole, yeah, it's probably interesting. So it hits all those notes. Um, and I've considered my readers in that I am dealing with rhetoric. I am dealing with academic stuff. And then, yeah, so I have the basics of an argument. I have the building blocks. I have at least enough to have a plan and to know what research I need to do. I know what my next steps are. And that is the important part about drafting your argument. That's why you do this drafting process to get at least the basics down before you start your research. And that's why I ask you for like a topic. Um, so hopefully you have found this, if not interesting, then at least useful. I look forward to, uh, to seeing your your dis discussion boards this week. Take care. Bye.